Uh, welcome to the 2020 speakers program for uh, the USI, the ACT. For those who haven't met me or haven't bought a beer yet, uh, Air Vice Marshal retired Bill Henman. I've taken over from uh, Mick Crane and we're looking forward to presenting the speaker program for 2020. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting year regardless and I hope that we can synchronise our program to meet the emerging strategic and defence issues that uh, Australia is going to be facing in the near and distant future. Um, many of you here I think have been probably personally or one or two degrees of freedom removed from uh, the tragic bushfires, now floods, a uh, few people will remain untouched and I think we're going to see a broadening of what uh, security means for Australia. Uh, how defence has always been symbiotic with that in terms of providing ad hoc support. Um, I think there is a case for how the country now needs to have a more coherent and uh, synchronised uh, strategic approach to both security, big S security, beyond uh, physical security, but into the realms of climate uh, and now um, emergencies that are probably not going to be one-off, but are going to be more and more common. So it's quite appropriate uh, to kick off the year. We have Dr. John Blacksman. Uh, we had a quick discussion of what might be a suitable topic. And uh, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, the Prime Minister has made our case. So we've had defence contribute in the traditional ways, uh, the mechanisms and governance of that has been called into question, and what will result are questions of capacity, role, priority for our defence force in the service of big S security for the country. Uh, John today, who needs no introduction and I won't uh, go into details, um, obviously he's been working in this area for quite a while, and tonight uh, he's going to present and I hope start the conversation about how uh, this may be stitched together in a more coherent uh, sense but certainly raise the issues that we can't ignore any further. So uh, welcome again. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Bill. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out uh, on this wonderful, refreshing, wet evening. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's so nice after such a long, uh, very hot and fiery summer to have this rainfall. Um, what I want to talk about today is defence and national security after the fire emergency. Thinking about a way forward. And it is a reflection on my uh, work over the last year or so, drawing on the SWOT analysis I've undertaken and reflecting on an article I've got coming out in Security Challenges on a Plan B for the ADF, and uh, a couple of other thoughts that have occurred to me uh, in, uh, as I've reflected on what's happened over the last few months. And as we do a stop take on what's happened um, in the last few months, uh, over the 2018-19 period, the, the statistics I could uh, gather, we have nearly 400,000 emergencies. Um, for the fires over the last couple of months, we had between five and a half and 6,000 ADF personnel involved. We've had volunteers from a whole range of friendly nations coming to assist us. The United States, Canada, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, Indonesia. Uh, the Prime Minister acknowledging that when President Joko Widodo was here only a few days ago, very positive. And the scale of this thing, though, has been so horrendous. Um, 186,000 square kilometres, thousands of buildings, uh, three dozen people killed, uh, a billion animals or more killed, billions of dollars of expense, uh, and we haven't yet tallied up the effect on tourism. Hundreds of thousands of people have been involved. Um, and you can see there the, the resources we've had available there's about 207,000 state and ter territory volunteer firefighters, about 23, 24,000 emergency service personnel, which if you add them together, about 231,000. The ADF, sworn police officers, paramedics, uh, I'm just putting these figures here about border force as well, to give you a sense of the scale of we're investing in the national security space. 
And I put a figure here because I want to talk about this further in a moment. This idea of 18 year olds. I reckon there's about 275,000 18 year olds out there. And I got this from looking at uh, uh, education reporting uh, at the moment in, in secondary education ac in, across the nation. So about 275,000 18 year old Australians every year. Now, with bushfire assist, we saw the Defence Force contribute, as I say, about five and a half thousand people, a, a, a joint task force based on deployable joint force headquarters with three uh, joint task forces underneath from four, five and nine brigades, um, multinational rotary wing task group, air, um, air mobile response teams, a whole range of bits and bobs with elements from uh, uh, international uh, contributions as well. Amazing to see how welcome that was also amazing to see how well the ADF was able to do that basically off the line of march so they're not fire trained firefighters in their training but the skills that they brought to the equation were particularly useful logistics transport engineering communications catering uh, you name it they brought it to the equation making an enormous difference uh, and continuing to do so but as you and I know Fires are not the only challenge out there. So the idea that we can just turn everything off and just focus on fires is illusory. We have enormous challenges as these diagrams capture. In the Pacific, these microstates of the Pacific face enormous challenges to this day. And there are a lot of them are about environmental concerns, but not just environmental concerns. There are governance challenges and there is a whole range of issues relating to great power contestation in this space. So we can't really afford to just focus on the fires, nor can we really afford to just focus on floods or pandemics or cyber issues or terrorism. They will all get the headlines for a day or two or so or more this year. These issues, the floods are hitting the newspapers now. The fires have been there with us for the last three months. Who knows when uh, cyber or terrorism will hit? We're dealing with the, the coronavirus and the pandemic uh, of that at the moment, the scale of which we haven't quite yet fathomed. So the scale and the breadth of the issues is what I tried to cover in this geostrategic SWOT analysis for Australia when I looked at the internal strengths and weaknesses and external opportunities and threats. And increased environmental challenges are very much in that threat space that we, we talked about last year. Um, and I, I, I won't dwell on that because I know some of you have seen this before and, and we've talked about it extensively. But if we want to avert catastrophe, we need to be mindful of the spectrum of global security challenges we are facing into the future. It's not just fires, it's not just floods or pandemics, and it's not just China. It's actually the confluence of all of these factors together that are giving us a real headache and that are giving our leaders a challenge that seems to be at the moment a bit beyond them. So what I'm hoping to do is to outline a way forward that actually might work, that is uh, feasible and that hopefully can get bipartisan support. Because we know that the overlap of these factors, great power contestation, environmental challenges and governance challenges leaves us with a space in the middle that is dark and foreboding for which we need to formulate realistic holistic responses and when we think as we break this up tease this out a little bit uh, you can see there's a whole range of plausible uh, potentially concurrent demands on the Australian Defence Force and I've listed them there humanitarian disaster catastrophic fires and floods contested man-made crises a support to regional security partners, um, multifaceted terrorist incidents abroad or, ash or uh, ashore, cyber attacks, border security challenges, uh, disasters threatening Australian Antar Australia's Antarctic Territory, um, what my, my colleague Brendan Taylor called the four flashpoints of Northeast Asia, the Korean Peninsula, East China Sea, the South China Sea and Taiwan. All of these are ones that could emerge in the next few months. None of them are that far off. The fuse is not long. Now we've dealt with fires so far 
and we did it off the line of march with the adf the volunteer firefighters have done a, an amazing job we're all very proud of them but it was one issue if we are to face two or three of these challenges concurrently the system i would contend cannot cope so what do we do we have a defense force that's essentially a one-punch force it cannot sustain attrition in serious conflict um, we've got widespread personnel shortages hmas perth just recently finished being refurbished um, the anzac class frigate sitting up on stilts and Fremantle because we've got no, don't have enough sailors to operate it we've got a one division regular army of three combat brigades and some enablers and some special forces but we forget that at the height of the second world war a country of only 8 million generated just in land force terms 14 divisions we have one active division today and one in reserve we have a navy of a dozen or so warships a handful of submarines an air force of 100 or so fighters and support aircraft for the whole enabling functions but nobody wants conscription it, because of the toxicity of vietnam it's understandable there's a reluctance to go there in terms of thinking through the implications so what does this mean well we've got short-term and long-term problems australia's internal capacity to mobilize is weak australia power is diminishing in relative terms globally indonesia is set to eclipse us in the next two decades a country 10 times our population we need to be more powerful and agile just to stand still and yet the policy environment is designed for operational short-term crises so we'd respond magically amazingly to the fires and to the floods the volunteers the adf the ses the police everybody does sterling work but it's short term we're not thinking strategically who's thinking about what's going to happen for our children let alone our grandchildren where is the visionary projection of what capabilities need to be developed now for the future not just for the next elections so i put to you that another way forward is required now there are several four structure proposals that have been touted by security pundits uh, and i want to just touch on some of them briefly now because i think it's worth reflecting on what i would consider a broad consensus that seems to be emerging in this space so let's go through them now hugh white uh, a great colleague of mine at the uh, uh, strategic and defense study center um, he's, he's, got, he's put up what Marcus Hellier describes as an indigestible wombat proposal. I kind of like that. It's a, it, it, he wants to double the fighter aircraft fleet, double down on submarines, cut back on land and amphibious and surface warfare assets, and basically distance ourselves from the, the United States. Almost go, you know, isolationist. Um, uh, I, I have a number of concerns with that, and I've listed some of them here. I think this is based on a situated appreciation. It's premised on an unlikely and implausible scenario uh, but it also it, it, it when you situate the appreciation you actually you you make yourself vulnerable to other scenarios for which you have not situated yourself um, it plays down vulnerabilities in china it plays down the agency of our neighbors indonesia why aren't we engaging with them why isn't this a major factor in our equation it it plays down the positive effects of regional adf engagement by focusing on submarines and aircraft, how many uh, Indo-Pacific Endeavour exercises can you do with a submarine? Not too many. How many humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations can you conduct off Fiji, Solomon Islands, PG, uh, uh, PNG, uh, Timor, or Aceh, uh, or somewhere else with submarines or fighters? Not too many. Um, it plays up the US in, 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 looming demise, it plays up self-reliance prospects, but it doesn't address challenges beyond great power contestation. As I put here, great power contestation is only part of the equation. The challenges we face are more than that. Ross Babbage um, has you know, talked about ripping, ripping a bloody arm off, uh, a, a, an offensive force that might want to attack us. Um, he wants to boost spending, deter through independent defence capabilities, um, and he stressed regional practical cooperation on maritime domain awareness and close to US engagement. Um, 
there are some concerns there. I, I don't think he addresses the challenges beyond great power contestation. And of course, America's increasingly transactional approach to ideational leadership, which is deeply worrying. Dib and Beasley have recently, uh, uh, Paul Dib, a former head of the Strategic and Defence Study Centre, uh, a former Deputy Secretary of Strategy, Kim Beasley, the former Defence Minister, um, have argued in, in their proposal, they've talked about the risk of major power conflict. It grows because China and Russia may act together to exploit Western weaknesses. Um, he talked about shortened warning time, the great definer of that idea of warning time. Uh, we don't have 10 years anymore, that's for sure. Um, and talking about the tactical and strategic advantage of the sea air gap being eroded. He's now, they're both arguing now for forward defence in depth and for increasing defence spending. Of course, this is really not a very detailed proposal um, and uh, some issues there need to be fleshed out. Uh, but once again, it's about great power contestation. Malcolm Davis has come up with a, what he talks about as forward defence in depth as well from what he calls a hardened north. He likes the comparison with Singapore's so-called poison shrimp, the idea of being muscular and the ability to assert yourself in a way that makes you less attractive uh, as, a, as a target. Um, and he's talked about burden sharing, uh, interdependence, self-reliance, distributed lethality. He talked about posturing well forward to counterbalance the rising China and being able to respond to challenges and about developing A to AD, anti-access area denial, capabilities focused on the South China Sea and exploiting vital maritime straits and choke points throughout Southeast Asia. Of course, there's, there's issues there about the details that goes with that. Uh, and I, we, I can, I, on a lot of ang aspects of that, I, I, I really think are, are on the money. Um, but once again, we, we're focusing on, on great power contestation. And I think we need to go beyond that. My uh, colleague uh, recently promoted to Professor Stefan Fruling, um, which is really uh, very, I'm very pleased for him. Stefan's a great colleague. He's done some great thinking, a lot of great work. He's argued that um, uh, we need to place more emphasis on preparations for major war than in the past. And I don't disagree. Um, he's talked about a whole run, range of capabilities. We need to focus on developing extra KC-30 tankers, more munition stocks and resupply, Kongsberg missiles for the F-35, increasing pilots, improving fuel stock and infrastructure, levering technological advances, um, getting uh, more P-8 Poseidons for sea lane protection, offshore patrol vessels with anti-submarine uh, uh, warfare capabilities, with land-based uh, anti-ship cruise missiles. He's also talked about putting a garrison on Cocos Island. These are actually pretty good ideas. Um, that once again, the focus is on great power contestation. There is a real question about costing. Uh, oh. It's one I think that needs to be grappled with. But what, if you're not noticing, there's a bit of a pattern emerging. Jim Molan, before the fires came along, <laughs> talked about needing a national security strategy. Uh, God bless him. Um, uh, and a new parliamentary committee for, over, for effective oversight. Um, Talked about defence policies, funding and posture needing to adapt and the Pacific becoming a theatre of great power competition. It's hard to argue with what he's saying there. He's also talked about a holistic stra strategy covering defence and areas critical to national resilience, nat natural resources, liquid fuels, energy and transportation. There's a lot of con congruence with what I've been uh, thinking and, and writing as well in what he's suggesting here as well. Obviously, there are issues about costings, the political will to resolve these issues, um, and the question about capability enhancements yet to be fleshed out. His centre of gravity paper on this is well worth reading. It came out last year, um, around about the time my centre of gravity on the SWOT analysis came out. But he's also thinking about looking beyond just great power contestation uh, to the issues of environmental challenges uh, and governance challenges, and I commend him for that. Um, so I think there's some uh, cross thing in a pollination that's required and useful here. Jim, in, in light of the fires, has also come out talking about the need for uh, stressing once again fuel and missile stocks need boosting because of the vulnerability of the system. He talks about preserving the uh, rural fire service <coughs> volunteering system. He said volunteers should be compensated for loss of income and the ADF does what it can to assist but is not trained to fight fires. So there's some questions here. Is the Rural Fire Service or the Country Fire Association or the Country Fire Service, depending on which state you belong to, uh, the, the voluntary ethos, is that enough? Is it fair to rely on volunteers? 
is it sustainable to rely on volunteers? Is what we faced this summer as bad as it gets? Or are we going to face worse in future? I'm not banking on it being as bad as it gets. No one knows the future, of course, but the trends, the trend lines aren't positive. And there's a question about whether paid service devalues volunteerism. And I've, and I've, I've, I've mulled over these issues because we want to think about holistically what we can do, we as a nation can do. Peter Jennings has talked about um, <clears throat> being at war with nature and calling in the professionals, the military professionals, like the fire is a, is a war. Um, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, I think having a national security advisor reinstated, reinvigorated is, is important, uh, particularly if we're gonna do what I think we need to do, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, uh, a disaster response command, uh, there's a question, it, it, you know, it's not an invalid question. Uh, if DJFHQ is busy with a external emergency amongst that long list of nine potential broad scenarios that might happen concurrently, I think that it is a question worth, worth asking. The question then is, can Joint Operations Command sustain uh, multiple operations? I mean, we already do that. Um, um, as uh, General Crane knows this all too well. Um, sustaining operations, multiple operations through Joint Operations Command is something Joint Operations Command is deliberately intent, designed to be able to do. Um, and, but he's also talked about units optimised for disaster response. And I'm thinking, uh, my sense is the units that were actually combat units actually were kind of optimised already. For disaster. The engineers, the transport, uh, all the logistics, the, the helicopters, um, the, the, the naval elements, the Air Force elements uh, were already uh, heading in that direction. Um, and uh, so a disaster ready reserve, I like the idea of a ready reserve. I think a disaster one uh, in, the, in, in the ADF uniformed, I think may be a bit of a stretch. And there's certainly some questions about costing there. So I have a number of concerns. I think the National Security Advisor is a good idea, but it needs to be at arm's length from the tyranny of the urgent. And this is one of the reasons why I think this idea of a National Institute of Net Assessment is important. We need some kind of national body that isn't caught up with the 24-hour news cycle, that can actually look out. That's not just about the use of the ADF, but it's about the use of the national resources writ large for our grandkids, not just for the next election. Um, um, and obviously there's been some pushback to Peter's idea about the Disaster Response Command because of the work that's already happening at the headquarters of the Rural Fire Service and the State Emergency Services. And I think that's a fairly valid point. Um, and also I'm concerned about the distraction from ADF core skills, the core skills of the ADF, given the spectrum of challenges we look like we're gonna to have to face in the, in the, in the time ahead, uh, we can't afford to dilute those. Um, and besides their workflow, you think about the logistics, the engineers, the transport units that are already responsive, I, I think we're good there. And the ready reserve, uh, I think the ready reserve concept is useful for the ADF, for us to actually have for combat power. Um, but I think there's also, uh, so bolstering the ADF is a good idea, but also some kind of expansion of the emergency response resources <coughs> is useful to think about. So I think he's on the money to a point there. Um, and regional closer ties, absolutely a must. And what's been heartening to see, Indonesia uh, send engineers, Papua New Guinea send engineers. That's really, it's, 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 it's an honor for us to receive them. It's a mark of respect for them that we appreciate their contributions, given the fact that we've on the past been give, uh, dishing it out. Um, and it's really great we give them an opportunity respectfully to reciprocate. That is such a positive, really very positive thing. Mike Kelly has had a crack at this as well. He talked about national service for school years, a school leavers, a gap year program, similar to the ADF's gap year program, which has only got a few hundred people involved in it. Um, and, and perhaps uh, giving uh, concessions over the higher education contribution scheme or the vocational educational training programs to encourage people to come uh, and, and give them some kind of reward for that. 
Uh, he's talked about medals for emergency service uh, and benefits and concessions for service. And he's talked about it being voluntary, but maybe mandatory if recruitment drives don't work. So there's a real question here about how much we provide incentives for people to volunteer into this space, or do we make it compulsory and but give them options? Um, <clears throat> I think what he's got, he's onto something here. I think it's by and large a great idea. My only concern, it's not a Liberal Party idea. Uh, and therefore, there's prospects of it being uh, seen as a bit of a political football that the Liberal, uh, the Conservatives don't want to buy in on. Uh, I hope that that's not the case and that the, the basically the confluence of factors between the proposals that Jim Mullins come up with uh, and that Mike Kelly is talking about, they're actually not that far apart. Um, so here's my plan B. <clears throat> I think we need a political and societal reawakening and I think the fires may well be that trigger. I'm hoping that that's the case and I'm hoping that this discussion may well help keep that ball rolling. I think we need to establish an, a National Institute of Net Assessment. I think the idea of a National Security Advisor is a good one. My concern uh, people said, oh, John, what about ONI? Isn't that their job already? No. ONI, firstly, you've got to have a positive vet security clearance to work there. And their mission is intelligence. It's not policy advice. It's not policy outcomes. It, and it's not about planning for the future. It's not planning for our grandkids. And it's not an institution set up because of its security constraints to draw in expertise from across the nation and beyond collaboratively. Now, there are those who would say, oh, John, there's worries because, you know, it's going to get hijacked by some, you know, extremist political wing that might want to play with it and come up with something ridiculous. Uh, I think there are ways to risk manage this with a national security advisor having oversight of this. I think we need to strike a grand compact with the South Pacific, and I've got a piece coming out in the next edition of Australian Foreign Affairs outlining that proposal. I don't want to dwell on it today but I think it's something worth considering. I think we need to bolster ADF endurance in the face of adversity and prolonged possible security challenges. I think we need to deepen our ties with the US and NATO. It's counterintuitive. People are saying we should be distancing ourselves. I think the opposite is the case. We are, we are heavily invested we're, uh, in, in our relationship with the United States and with many of the NATO partners, including Canada, France and the UK, uh, as well as others such as Germany. We're heavily invested with them. We should look with sober judgment at the enduring utility of those ties and not let the Trumpian tweets distract us from the enduring importance of those ties. We need to deepen ties with ASEAN and with others work, willing to work with Australia, uh, including over things like the Rohingya crisis. But ASEAN, particularly Indonesia, uh, these are, this country is critically important to our future. We, we, we've, we've spent a generation conceptually, literally and metaphorically skipping over Indonesia on our way to somewhere else. And as a result, we have a nation full of people who don't even know how to say uh, uh, Salam Abagi. Hello, good morning. Um, it's, it's a tragedy. We've allowed this to happen to ourselves. I think we need to reimagine our engagement over Antarctica, and that's another talk, but it is something very much worth monitoring. China is certainly very active in that space, and they are thinking intergenerationally about the prospects of exploitation down south. But what I do want to focus on today is a proposal for an Australian universal scheme for national and community service involving a whole range. Oh, let me just focus here. The whole idea of my concern is that the overlap here generates this dark space in the middle over the overlapping uh, Venn diagram that is potentially deeply dark, folks, and we need to risk manage this, and we need to invest in plans and capabilities to manage that risk. So, an Australian Universal Scheme for National Community Service, I think it can be shared. This requires constructive engagement with a whole range of bodies. Now, some people might say, John, this is too hard, it's too out there, uh, way too much, too complex. Well, I'm sorry, but have you got a better idea? 
we actually need to rise above the limitations we've imposed on ourselves. Oh, that's a state issue. Oh, that's a federal issue. Uh, oh, no, that's their state, not my state. Um, we actually need to have the Council of Australian Governments work through this problem. The Rural Fire Service or the CFS or the CF, uh, CFA, the state emergencies, the national parks, paramedics, uh, the, the, Australian Aid or the Australian Volunteers International, um, what I would call an Australian Youth Regional Engagement Pro uh, Program, Aussie Rep perhaps, uh, ADF Gap Year Plus, uh, Police, uh, Border Force and so on. So let's just t t tease this out a little bit and humour me please as, as I kind of try and conceptualise this because this is still a work in progress. This is just some articulation of some ideas that have yet to be tested that, that need some refinement. Uh, and I'm hoping that between us we can actually come up with some useful refinements to make this more robust, more marketable, more, more politically saleable. Um, but essentially, I'm, I, I have come down with a view that it, it probably should be voluntary, but strongly encouraged with incentives to participate and disincentives not to. But maybe compulsory if in the couple of years the numbers don't stack up. But I think we, get, we need to give voluntarism a, a go uh, with some incentives. I think there needs to be variable length of full-time and part-time, uh, depending on the program and the training investment for those particular programs. The ADF particular skill sets in that in the ADF might require a longer commitment uh, for you know, which we can gauge the interest of the various volunteers. Uh, there needs to be skills recognition for employability beyond their, their time in the OSNACs. Um, service recognition, uh, this is something that Mike Kelly talked about, medals and bonuses. I think this is really useful a plan where we can recognise people's contributions. Uh, job opener opportunities as, as a taster for employment. Some people might actually want to make a career of working in the Navy um, uh, or in the police or in any of these agencies. Uh, and having a taster by, by kind of almost, not quite forcing, but really strongly encouraging people to choose where they'll contribute might actually have a transformative effect. Um, HEX concessions, as I say, scalable incentives to the level of contribution that would have to be worked out. Uh, a path to early citizenship for non-citizen non residents. Um, and, and I think there's something here about the, the, the potential bonding effect of, of, on a multicultural society of young people from wherever they come from working together uh, as fireys, as soldiers, sailors or airmen or women or in any of these other agencies, collaboratively. Um, and the idea of bringing city kids to the bush, I mean, it's one of those ideas out there. It's not the be all and end all, but I think it's worth factoring into our thinking about the utility. So let's now just tease that out further, go one step further and think about in the specific instances, okay? So let's say with the rural fire service, and I'm just picking that one name rather than giving, uh, dop uh, doffing my hat to all of the names, but essentially, you know what I'm talking about, the fireys and the emergency folk. Um, perhaps a two year full time service combined, perhaps with off peak work in national parks, um, uh, rehabilitating uh, national parks, uh, uh, perhaps coordinating placement with the ADF reserve and the depots. Uh, perhaps we could utilise, I mean, one of the questions people have put back to me is, John, that's going to cost a bomb, right? Well, perhaps we could use Army, Army the Reserve, Defence Force, reserve facilities as the, as the the, the common meeting ground. I mean, they're not used by the reserves all the time anyway. Um, perhaps we could double hat them. Um, um, Australian Volunteers International is a really great program. Um, I think we need to really double down on this with what I would call the Aussie Rep, uh, Australian Youth Regional Engagement Program, uh, like a Peace Corps, like an Australian Peace Corps uh, connected with Australian aid. I think it could be a two-year program including language training and regional placements, perhaps with non-government organisations or civil society organisations uh, in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Um, possibly including new Colombo Plan student programs uh, uh, or working at least in a way that uh, derives benefit from the investment we're already making in that program. Then there's paramedics, uh, perhaps a two-year job placement with paramedics uh, uh, and vocational training with state health services. 
with part-time options afterwards. The whole range of um, uh, uh, aged care, medical care, uh, 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 hospice care opportunities that might arise for people should they get the training, the qualifications, the taste for this work um, from this experience through OSNEX. Uh, now I had a map there of Australian national parks just to give you an idea of how many national parks there are around Australia to which people could be committed uh, in the off-peak months to, to engage on, uh, on a whole range of projects that Australian national parks in conjunction with the state national parks work on. Um, then of course there's the ADF. We already have the idea of a gap year. We've had the Ready Reserve. It worked a charm in the past. Uh, it's, it's a proven concept um, of two years full-time service, perhaps with five years reserve service thereafter with hex paid proportionally or soft startup loans for those who want to do, don't necessarily want to do tertiary education but want to do, have a business or something like that. Um, then of course similarly with the police, with state and federal police, a two years full-time service potentially with, with hex um, uh, 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 concessions or soft loans and similarly with the, with the border force, Australian border force. There's a whole range of options. Now, one of the things that has been said to me by senior defence officials is, John, I don't want a full crop of 18 year olds. I don't need that many. But if we were to just think about this and actually split it, I mean, no one agency does, clearly. But if we were to think about it in a slightly different way and, and think about how nationally we could do this, then perhaps we could come up with a scheme that would work that wouldn't actually swamp uh, each one. Let's just tease this out a little bit before we go on to consider that further. Hex, the, the level of hex would be subject to a scale based on the length and difficulty of the commitment. COAG endorsement would be required with federal and state and territory governments buying in on this. A coordination agency for state federal components, its terms and conditions probably would be required. Um, clearly what would be required to make this happen is visionary political leadership. So our politicians need to buy in on this. I'm hoping that that is not uh, too much of an ask. Um, and, uh, and as I say, perhaps collaborate in the use of facilities, save some expenses by not having to build new facilities, but work on the ones we already have. That in, and after all, most of our reserve institutions around the nation are really well plugged into the community. Many of them are dual rolled with these very organisations that I'm talking about us perhaps collaborating with. So that's something to think about. The fire service, um, um, I think, you know, I, I appreciate the voluntary nature of it. And I know we've got some fireys here, Neil, and I doff my hat there for your work over the last few months. Um, but I think we need to incentivise voluntary men membership and provide some special concessions as well for that space. Improve the institutional support for service with a perhaps a retention bonus and encourage more generous coverage of expenses, anticipatory coverage of expenses, perhaps. We need to modernise and expand the ground and air fleet, I believe. Um, this is an M113 uh, modified for use as a firefighter with a remote weapon system water cannon uh, used by the Portuguese. Uh, we've got hundreds of them and we're going to get rid of them. We could repurpose them. We've got the Australian design Bushmaster. The South Australians have these. I don't know how many other fire services have considered employing that, that, that vehicle. Um, we've got Canadian, Canadians. These water bombers are all locked up in ice in, in, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, apparently. Um, but there's, there's really more work to be done in terms of beefing up our ability to respond uh, with firefighting equipment. And of course, also beef, beefing up the the ties, the equipment and personnel sharing arrangements with our Canadian and, uh, and, and American brethren. Um, Navy, um, this is more than just about the national uh, and community service scheme, uh, but I endorse the requirements that, that, that people are calling for, for a beefing up of capability. I think we should not be looking to retire the Anzacs, we should be looking to keep them. They're just being upgraded now. Uh, we cannot build the OPVs and the new future frigates fast enough. We need to keep what we've got. We shouldn't be selling off the FFGs, uh, but that, I guess I appreciate that that's already happened. But I don't know if you've got it, folks, but the, the, the Chinese are building the, the size of the Australian Navy every year. So uh, we, we, we need to just have a wake up call. We, we cannot afford to keep operating the way we have 
assuming that everything's just hunky-dory, much as it's been in the post-Cold War years. It's not. The world's changing. We've got to wake up. So, we need to keep the Collins. Yes, build more new ones, but keep the Collins. Taiwan has submarines operational today that were built by the US in 1945. It can be done. Just because they're old doesn't mean they don't work or that they have to be retired. Now, I get that the Navy's got issues with personnel. I get that. But they're overcomable if we have the will and we commit the resources. I think we need an extra LHD. We need rotation. We need more AORs. We need drones. We need to get serious about drones. Our potential adversaries are all over it. And we're just tinkering at the edges. Uh, we need to invest in facilities at Manus. We're doing it, but not, on, not nearly on the scale we should be. In Darwin, in Brisbane, in Weeper, and elsewhere. Then there's air and space force options. Uh, um, I know the JSF's got its problems, but I think we need to increase that. We obviously need to retain the Hornets. Um, I think we need to really double down on drones. Um, the Loyal Wingman program is very exciting. Uh, I'm very excited about that. But we also need to double down on enablers, and they're listed there, C-17s, P-8, refuelers, AEW and C. Uh, uh, some people have talked about the B-21. Uh, we don't have a capability like we had with the F-111. Uh, I think it's, it's a serious conversation we should be having with ourselves and with our uh, allies. And then satellite and energy satellite capabilities as well. Army options. I think we need an extra brigade of regular force. I think there's a compelling argument to put it out west. I think we need to fully staff our enabling brigades, 6, 16 and 17 brigades, the Loggies, the Aviation, the I-Star. Uh, they seriously need to be beefed up to operate in a rotational, capa with rotational capacity. Our reserve brigades have done a fantastic job fighting fires and assisting with fighting fires. They need to be seriously beefed up. Uh, and we need to be looking at the Pacific and Southeast Asia. I don't know if you recall, but in 1941-42, when we really faced a threat, we worked collaboratively then with the Dutch East Indies uh, in terms of airfield defence. And we didn't have the resources to do it properly, but we should be looking to collaborate much more effectively and much more closely with Papua New Guinea, with Indonesia and with others in our neighbourhood. Much more closely and much more effectively. Um, and Border Force and Special Operations Command and Cyber Force, these are areas that all can do with beefing up as well. Um, part of this is about doubling down on our investment in international ties, the firepower defence arrangement, that wonderful, you know, in one sense an anachronistic organisation, but in another, an organisation with a huge future. Malaysia wants it, Singapore wants it, we want it, the Kiwis still want it, uh, the Brits want to keep back into it, in fact, they're doubling down on it. Uh, it's got enormous potential. ASEAN. People love to poo-poo ASEAN as a broken reed. But we forget that when ASEAN was created, we were fighting. We had troops on combat operations all across Southeast Asia. We don't today. And that's in large part thanks to ASEAN. So careful what you wish for all those people out there who poo-poo ASEAN. This is an organisation that, through, particularly through the ADMM Plus construct, really serves us well um, and yes it's a pain to go to these forums that you know operate at glacial pace i get that but if you look back over the last decade at what they have achieved and what they what conflicts they have avoided um, it should be an absolute no-brainer to double down on our investment in that space and manis i've talked about this before manis is the bahasa indonesia word for sweet I think it could be an acronym for Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Singapore, a regional maritime cooperation forum, dare I suggest. USA, I've touched on that. Japan and Korea, looking at the challenges we face in a very similar light, collaborating, coordinating with them needs to happen. NATO, as I say, France, UK, Canada, with an investment in our space, shared concerns, shared interests that are enduring. So. Now, I want to go back to the, the OSNEX, and I've just got here a hypothetical straw man idea of how we might be able to do this. And 
I recognise this is these are straw man figures, but if you think about it, if we've got 275,000 18 year olds each year, then perhaps we can expect that maybe three to four fifths of them will want to buy in on this program. And that between these organisations, the fire service, the SES, the national parks, the paramedics, volunteers abroad, the defence force, the police and the border force, we can actually generate a, a, a mechanism whereby our young men and women can make a contribution to the Australian Universal Scheme of National and Community Service. Now funding is potentially a problem um, and I think we do need to think hard about how we do so but we have, dare I say, and I know this is um, sacrilege for some people, but our resources sector doesn't pay very much. We're giving away our resources for a song. A lot of people are getting very, very wealthy off our resources and Australia doesn't get very much for it. And given, and I get that on in, in fairer times, maybe we can afford to just let that continue. But I'm sorry, folks, the clouds are getting darker. They're looming. The challenges are growing and they're overlapping. So the old way just isn't good enough anymore. We really need to think in a fresh way, a deeper way, with the long term in mind, intergenerationally, holistically, about what we're facing. Because the past is not the future. The future is going to look very different. And it's going to involve great power contestation. It's going to involve a spectrum of environmental challenges coupled with a whole range of governance challenges. They're all going to hit us smack in the face concurrently. And we're not ready. We weren't ready for the fires. We picked ourselves up. We made that work. But that was one challenge. If we get four or five of these overlapping at once, we're hooped. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been most gracious and very patient. I shall end there in my...